Thank you. The, the link with Peter Elwood and MRC and my work on inequalities is Peter said to me when we shook hands this afternoon that he had one thing he held against me, and that's when he invited me to come to Cardiff to join his unit. I said no. <laughs> and I've never forgiven you. <laughs> Well, this is why, this is what kept me in London. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was involved in the Whitehall study, um, which was. <clears throat> Bear with me, Mike. Decide whether we want to relate to that. Which was set up by Donald Green and Jeffrey Rose. <clears throat> Jeffrey said to me, you're interested in social things. We don't have anything social in the Whitehall study except people's employment grade. But otherwise, it's a smoking, it's a study of smoking and other risk factors. And of course, the other Jerry wasn't involved in the Whitehall study, but was an enormous influence on me personally. And we used to talk about inequalities in health all the time, um, long after. I was at the School of Age. <coughs> this is 25 year follow up from the Whitehall study. The lower the grade, the higher the mortality from coronary heart disease. This um, is controlling for age, smoking, systolic blood pressure, plasma cholesterol, height, and blood sugar. And I then launched the Whitehall 2 study to look at other determinants. I said at the time that uh, a high grade civil servant was the end point of biological evolution. The perfect biological specimen was a Whitehall administrator, which might be the source of some of our problems. <laughs> and it wasn't just civil servants, of course. Uh, this was figure one from my 2010 review. Um, classifying people by where they live, classify where they live by the index of multiple deprivation. Uh, life expectancy follows this remarkable gradient. This is nationally for England. And healthy life expectancy is a much steeper gradient. In other words, not only do people in more deprived areas have shorter lives, they spend more of those shorter lives in your health. People at the time, of course, say it's got to be healthcare. They've forgotten that we have, and even Tudor Hart, um, who talked about the inverse care law, said, I never thought it was about healthcare. Um, I wrote that paper because I saw creeping privatization of the NHS, and that's what I didn't want. And that was back in 1971. Uh, I did a commentary on the paper. In fact, um, I love honouring people in the 90s. I did the Tudor Hart lecture when Tudor Hart, I think, was 90, uh, just about he died soon. I think there's not a causal connection. Tudor Hart never thought it was only about healthcare, even though he said it was the most careful. So we launched the Global Commission on social determinants of health. And in a way, I say there was a direct link between <coughs> Whitehall and global <coughs> health inequalities, J.W. Lee, me with a ridiculous screen, um, J.W. Lee, the Director General, President Lagos of Chile, uh, who hosted our first meeting and then joined the commission. And he said, the goal is not an academic exercise. We want uptake with policymakers. And we launched our report in 2008, closing the gap in a generation. Remember him? <laughs> Gordon Brown, when we launched the report in London, Gordon Brown announced that he'd invited me to do a review of health inequalities in England. The question was, how could we apply the findings and recommendations of the Global Commission to one country. And in 2010, we published 
fair society, healthy lives. And we had six domains of recommendations. We had, for the Global Commission, we had nine knowledge networks. So we really, this was an evidence-based commission. We had, each knowledge network had maybe 20 or sometimes more people, north, south, global north, global south. For the English review, we set up nine working groups to summarize the evidence on inequalities in health. And we slimmed it all down into six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, consistent with what Nish just reported to us. Education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Number four has a little bit of relevance quite at the moment. Everyone should have the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. We should not have one in seven households in food insecurity, which is what we currently have. Healthy and sustainable places and communities and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. So it's not saying that diet, smoking, physical activity are unimportant, but look at the social determinants of those behaviors. We looked 10 years on, had government listened? Well, it looked like they had listened and done the opposite. <laughs> and this was the effect. Life expectancy that had been improving one year every four years for about a hundred years. I took it back to 1980. By taking it back to 1890, it was an improvement of about one year every four years and there was a break in the curve. I don't know how you do a Mendelian randomization on the election of a conservative-led coalition. <laughs> um, I was, of course, cautious when we published our tenure on review. It might be, it could be on one hand, on the other hand, it's just possible. Um, I've got a bit less cautious, I must say. I think the evidence is pretty strong that rolling back of the state Policies of austerity led to this slowdown and the increase in inequalities. And it's really very interesting if you look by region. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. Life expectancy, there's small regional variations, and life expectancy was improving a bit. For the most deprived decile, this is women, similar to the men, life expectancy was going up in London and going down in virtually every other region. And the regional differences was much bigger. In fact, if you look at the social gradient, it's much steeper in the Northeast and the Northwest than it is in, health, in life expectancy, than it is <coughs> in London and the Southeast. In other words, the disadvantage of multiple deprivation scores, a stronger predictor of ill health in the north of the country. And we got good evidence from Glasgow that that's the same. The structure of advantage and disadvantage is puts you at much bigger disadvantage in the north of the country and in Glasgow than it does in England. And then we had our 10 year on review 10 months later, the COVID 19 Marmot review. And we said that the pandemic would expose and amplify the underlying inequalities in society. Here's the social, this social gradient business is quite remarkable. It's not you're poor or you're not poor, you've got the risk, you haven't got the risk, it's social gradient. And I've been describing that since Whitehall 1, Whitehall 2, national data, the greater the deprivation, the higher mortality, and there's COVID-19. The social gradients are almost identical for COVID-19 mortality. I was talking to a group of dentists. So I put up this slide. That's the gradient in caries in five-year-old children. It looks identical by deprivation to the COVID-19 gradient. I was talking to a group of primary prevention in primary care of cardiovascular disease, obesity prevalence in year six, identical gradient. We think COVID's caused by a virus. 
we think dental caries is caused by diet and low fluoride and oral hygiene. We think childhood obesity is caused by diet, exercise, stress, <coughs> not a virus. And we hear government talking about, well, we got the vaccine, we solved it. No, you didn't. There's a problem, a small problem of health inequalities, whether it's COVID or dental caries or childhood obesity or diabetes, we've got to deal with inequalities. Recent ONS data. Wow. I talked about pre-COVID life expectancy falling for the most deprived. Here for men, life expectancy fell in this triennium 2018 to 20 compared with the previous three years for the bottom four deciles of deprivation. And for uh, women, there was improvement there. For men, it didn't really improve for any part. Now, that's largely a 2020 effect. Um, and of course, as I said, the gradient in healthy life expectancy is much steeper than the gradient in life expectancy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just length of life, the quality of life. Wow. You, have you heard government ministers say, well, the prime minister, you may have gone to a few parties, but he got the big things right. Mm. I lost track of what those big things were. Um, this is life expectancy 2019-2021, preprint from American colleagues, USA compared to 19 other countries. So the USA was a disaster. And which other countries look poor? Scotland? Northern Ireland, Germany, and England, and Wales. Wow, this is dreadful. We had the slowest improvement in life expectancy coming up to 2020 by any rich country except Iceland and the United States. And during the pandemic, we had the worst management of any of these 20 countries except the United States. We're doing something terribly wrong. And part of that are the big inequalities. We've been doing work in Greater Manchester in the Northwest. COVID mortality was 25% higher than the English average. You asked me when we were chatting, uh, what do I do if national government won't listen? Well, we work with people who invite us in. Coventry declared itself a Marmot city in 2010. I don't know if you know, but Lady Godiva is an icon of Coventry, and I imagine getting my kit off and <laughs> Manchester. I said to Andy Burnham, look, Coventry's a Marmot city. If Greater Manchester is a <clears throat> So Greater Manchester took it on. Luton wants to be the first Marmot town, Waltham Forest. We're launching our Cheshire and Merseyside report. And what all this is about is actually asking how much can happen at local level, regardless of what's happening at national level. And in a way, it's an experiment. I mean, the assumption is you can do good things. Gwent, said they want to be the first Marmot region in Wales. And for the first time, we're dining with the devil. Uh, we're trying to get industry to be good guys. In public health, we've always seen industry as the enemy for good reasons. We're going to sit down to dine with the tobacco industry. Uh, food, the food industry seems to have learned very little of the lessons from the tobacco industry. You're going to take money from the alcohol industry to support your research. I've always refused. I may have published data on the U-shaped curve, uh, but I always said alcohol is bad for public health. So we were funded by Legal and General to produce a report and to see what industry could do. And we said there are three areas, employment, 
every employer should pay the real living wage and conditions of employment are vital to health. So the products, what we consume, services and investment, and we talk about health care organizations as anchor institutions. What about the impact of industry on the environment of society? So we haven't got into bed with them and still somewhat at arm's length, but we're trying to get them to be the good guys. To finish, <coughs> what do I want government to do? <coughs> Given that I think health is a good measure of how well the society is functioning. And we were doing really badly up to 2020, as I showed you, life expectancy stopped improving. And then we did even worse during the pandemic. And I think there are four potential reasons for that that we need to address. Poor governance and political culture, increasing social and economic inequalities that we have to reverse, the reduction in spending on public services, we were ill-prepared coming into the pandemic, and we were unhealthy. So my number one recommendation is to put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. Thank you, Michael. Questions? Yes. Can you say who you are? Yeah, John Lee from Cardiff. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That's, I mean, the interesting thing is you get this discontinuity of truth, which you referred to, you know, a changing economic climate from the UK and austerity. But these are really complex issues, you know, if they're around psychology, sociology, social networks, um, underlying physical health and well being, historical methods from bygone years. And it's really how, what are the sorts of ways in which you think we can start tackling those issues? Well, we, we looked at this in our 2020 report, yeah. 10 years on report, and we went through the six domains from the 2010 report and looked in great detail at what had happened. Now, I don't think the increase in child poverty led to a shortened life expectancy. It takes a bit longer than that, but still, child poverty went down. The spending on education per child went down by 8%. 8% reduction in spending per child. Unemployment went down. That's great. Good. But unemployment benefits are remarkably stingy <laughs> compared with all other European countries and the rise of the gig economy which is bad for health. But number four, the increase in poverty. I've been thinking a lot about that with the cost of living crisis. Can it have acute effects in the short term? Yeah, I think it can. Financial insecurity, we've got evidence that financial insecurity increases risk of cardiovascular disease and mental illness when controlling for income. So there's a whole set of ways that can happen. Environment, I didn't go into this, the reduction in spending per person in the least deprived 20% of areas from 2010 on. So in the least deprived quintile, the reduction per person was 16%. And then the more deprived the area, the greater the reduction in the most deprived quintile was 32%. So the greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction in spending. What does local government do with that money? Provides adult social care, provides child care, provides short start children's centers. It looks after amenities. <coughs> it's not difficult, as Nish said, you know, you want to find potential pathways. Um, it's not difficult to find potential pathways. Um, by which that can happen. And we explored it, but what, as I said, when we published the report, I said it could be, it might be on one hand or the other. No, it's not an experiment. I can't say which of those mattered, but we've got good evidence that all of those things that I talked about do matter for health, and they all pretty much went in the wrong direction. My health, thank you for that too put me off trying to get any answers on this in Perfilly. We've only got two and a half thousand men, but there were 
have followed for 35 years and very, very detailed data were collected. Uh, our focus uh, towards the end was on healthy behaviors and a healthy lifestyle. And one of the most challenging uh, findings in that investiga investigation on along those lines was that in the higher social classes, social class one and two, there was a huge reduction uh, attributable to a healthy lifestyle, in diabetes, in vascular disease, in cancer, and in dementia, we were one of the first to publish on dementia in that context. But in social class four and five, we were able to match the uh, uh, subgroups uh, with regard to healthy behaviors. And the benefit of a healthy lifestyle in social class four and five was substantially less than in social class one and two. Now, we do have data on the uh, mood and uh, well-being and uh, psychological effects and i've been urging uh, that we do an analysis taking into account those possible confounding factors but the difference was massive so recommending a healthy lifestyle is really encouraging in the more affluent mm -hmm. the more able members of society but towards the sadly the bottom of uh, society it doesn't have nearly as much effect yeah i think that's right and i think the data would support you and my approach to what you call lifestyle has been twofold one is why does it tend to cluster in higher socioeconomic groups so what are the social determinants or if you like going the other way and you know, part of it again, look at current data. Uh, the Food Foundation published last week that one in seven households in Britain is food insecure. They've either missed eating, the adults have missed eating for a whole day, they haven't eaten when they were hungry, or they had less than they wanted because of lack of food. That will increase obesity, we know, because. If food insecure households eat dense, calorie dense food that's cheaper. And we already know that the childhood, the gradient in childhood obesity is getting steeper. Mm. Um, and children who are obese are something like three times more likely to become obese adults than children who are not obese. So the inequalities in obesity are going to increase because of problems with income and, and so on. So the two kinds of questions, one is, why do we get the social gradient in lifestyle? And the second is, what else is going on that interacts with lifestyle that puts people in a, at other risk? And we've got quite a lot of evidence of what that's about. There are psychosocial influence, there are other aspects that we don't capture in our lifestyle. One of the big questions I've got, because for one reason or another, I seem to be much involved in Wales at the moment, went uh, I'm on the Welsh Constitutional Commission, Bevan Commission, and one thing and another. So I seem to, um, again, it's as we were discussing, the government in Westminster is not the least bit interested in what I'm doing. I think that's probably wrong. They're quite interested and they don't want to know. Uh, but in Wales, they're really interested. And one of the questions, arguably, Wales has the most progressive government in Europe and they have worse health than England. What the hell's going on? Is it just that the poverty is being more extreme for longer? What's going on? You know, this is deeply upsetting. They've got these really lovely policies. They've got a basic income pilot. And um, they in trying to improve working conditions. And health is worse than in England. And the decline in life expectancy for the poorest people is more marked than in England. This is deeply upsetting and troubling to the researcher in me. So I may have turned policy wonk and activist from being a researcher, but I still <laughs> really want to know what the evidence shows. And it's 
some of the things you're talking about are clearly at play here. But bless you for what you're doing and challenging some of the tough people.